meeting. Um, welcome to everybody. Um, thank you for joining our AVID Readers Forum today. I'm always excited to see people come on time to such a forum. And I thank you so much for honoring our invitation. Without much ado, I'd like to ask Onesmas Musungu to lead us in a word of prayer, and then I will introduce the discussions for today's session. Onesmas, if you could hear me, if you can hear me, kindly take over and lead us in a word of prayer, and then we can start the session. Uh, good afternoon. Good afternoon. We can hear you. Go ahead. So let's uh, believe and pray. So, Almighty King of Glory, we come unto you this particular moment, thanking you for the gift of life you have granted unto us. May you bless the speakers as we are going to discuss this topic today. May you grant us knowledge and wisdom to unleash what will uh, be our beneficial and intellectual um, that will help us outdo and come up with the possible solutions. May you guide us throughout the, uh, the whole of this discussion and those all who have organized for this discussion. May you be with them and may you protect them. In the mighty name of Jesus Christ, we do pray and believe. Amen. Thank you, Onesmas. Um, team, today we have two discussants to lead us through the discussion. The person who suggested today's discussion is Mr. Tomkin Mobegi. Um, Tom Keen Mobegi is a doctoral researcher at the University of Liverpool, and he will tell us a bit more about himself before he gives us his thoughts around what we are discussing. But we also thought it prudent to include Harrison Bori. Harrison is also a doctoral researcher. I believe he's at Loyola. Um, Harrison is actually under the tutelage of Professor James Duogadi, who is the author of the article under discussion today. So Harrison, again, we are so pleased that you made the time to join our discussion. We are very excited to have you on board. So in terms of the order of the discussion, we will have Mr. Tomkin Mobegi take us through the initial discussion. He'll give us his thoughts. Harrison Bori will then take over and give us a response or his own thoughts around the article that we are reading and discussing today. And then in the usual manner, we will open up the floor to discussion by the participants. So just as we ordinarily do, if you have something you would like to bring to the attention of the discussants, kindly put it in the chat or at the end of the session when we open it up to the plenary, you can raise your hand and we will give you an opportunity to make your intervention. But without much further ado, because I want to give enough time to the discussion, I'll hand over to Mr. Tom Keen Mobegi, who will take us through the discussion for today. So Tom Keen, kindly take over, introduce yourself to our students and then lead us through your thoughts around what we are discussing. Karibu sana. Tomkin, you may need to unmute yourself. Right, yeah. Can everyone hear me now? All right. Uh, as I've been introduced, my name is Tomkin Mubegi, and thank you everyone for joining us today. I'm a doctoral researcher at the University of Liverpool. My research interest lies in international law, but I'm specifically interested in climate change from a third world perspective. That's an area that has historically lacked uh, some kind of interest from uh, non-global north scholars to, to, to get to put the lived reality of the global south into perspective, hence uh, the topic that we are discussing today. I'm not under as much pressure as Harrison, because even if I disappoint Gathi on my perspectives on his article, he might not get to catch me, but Harrison, Harrison is going to get it hard if, <laughs> if he doesn't uh, live up to the master's expectations. Anyway, today's topic is about Africa and the history of international law. For, for, let's say the youngest African country at the moment is Sudan and the oldest might be then, no, it's South Sudan and the oldest might then be the other Sudan. And so that's then, we're working at a range of around 10 to almost 60 years of independence in Africa. And within this period, then we can begin to to look at how Africa fits into international law, basically by asking ourselves a couple of questions. 
how does uh, how did Africa find herself in international law? Uh, what's the role of Africa in international law? Basically, are we norm makers or we are norm receivers? What contributions have African states, institutions, people, and scholars made in the development of international law? And when we take those contributions, do they define our lived reality in the contemporary? And if that reality does exist, is it really acknowledged by the other international players out there in the world? And then the reality of the African people. I keep on, in, I will keep on insisting that our African circumstances and lived reality is what we should use to gauge Africa's place in the history and development of international law. So to discuss today's topic, I will have, I will go like on six steps. So first one, I'll give a summary of the article and then I can, we can get to talk about some of the African perspectives that underpin the paper and then talk about the points of conflict between the two schools of thought that have been considered in the paper. What are some of the common grounds? What do they agree on? What, what don't they agree on? And I'll then comment on my biggest takeaway from the item that we're discussing today. From the dominant uh, Eurocentric knowledges that started developing between the 17th and 18th century by the European intellectual movement or known as the Enlightenment age, Africa began to be presented as a backward, uncivilized and barbaric place devoid of international law. So from this perspective, then we begin to see how Africa is introduced into international law. We're introduced as people who have who live in this dark con continent that's, that does not have any kind of norms that needs to be rescued from itself through the project of civilization. So these knowledges that define Africa as a backward stuck continent stuck in the past begin to shape how we will enter into international law. So James Clogardy then comes into this article. Uh, in a way, I take this article as a review of Olawale Elias's book on Africa and African the development of international law. Olawale, together with Felix Okoye, are some of the pioneers of the African contributionist approaches to international law. The article then is a historical uh, is a historical and contemporary exploration of the dynamics of African approaches to international law, in my opinion. So based on the questions that then I raised earlier, the article does not really address those questions specifically, but they can imply from the arguments that has been uh, developed throughout the pages, if you've got to read it. And this, arguments are developed by putting into perspective two African but immensely oppositional schools of thought on international law, the African Contributionist School and the Critical Legal Scholarship School. By definition, the contributionists are basically African scholars of international law whose work emphasizes that Africa has historically contributed to and shaped the development of international law right from the pre-colonial period to the post-colonial period. We'll get to talk about this in a few. But then by contrast, you get to find the critical scholars, James Tuogadi being one of them, Makao Mtua, for instance, Okafor, and many others that you can list. The, the field is growing. Harrison, I saw a couple of tweets. You are at Twail as well. So we can lump you into that category. And so, this school uniquely argues that historically Africa has been deliberately erased from the creation and use of international law. How are we erased? Through colonialism, through subjugation and through domination. Therefore you find scholars such as Makao Mtua who then conclude that international law is illegitimate, predatory, oppressive and unjust 
because of its contribution to the subjugation and domination of Africa in the post-colonial period. Basically, it's to say that colonialism never ended. It just changed its attire and started dressing in a formal kind of way where they invite you for coffee and take away your freedom every week. That's, that's the kind of a, a perspective that the critical scholars have. So back then to the contributionists, I will start with those ones so that I can put uh, their argument on the table and be able to proceed to also introduce the critical scholars so as to lay the basis for how we can pinpoint the areas of agreement and areas of disagreement. So according to contributionists, they, they argue that whereas international law is currently projected or since the 1970s or 60s, wherever dates they use, Whereas international law has been given a single Euro Eurocentric value that excludes every non-European experience from its development, Africans have historically contributed to the development of these legal norms that we call international law. And therefore they seek to correct the Eurocentric narrative by arguing that Africa is not a newcomer to international law. You cannot use our independence to say that the, on Independence Day, that's when we became a civilized nation that actively contributes to the development of international law. And therefore, they develop a narrative that uses the histories and the experiences of Africans to incorporate African voices into the development of international law, thereby disrupting that single value, single Eurocentric value that international law is European, it's Christian, and it originated from somewhere in Western Europe. They use uh, our histories, uh, for instance, Olawale focuses on ancient African government systems, such as the Carthaginian Empire, the trade relations that existed all the way from the Sudanic belt all the way to Tunisia through Timbuktu, you understand those things. And they use this to argue that notions such as universality and uh, civilization and development of customary practices have existed all along in the African community, the way we worked our things. We might not have had these smaller countries that came to, to result from the scramble and partition of Africa, but as a continent and as a people, we had norms that would currently then, if interpreted properly, fit into the whole international law narrative. And then other scholars, such as Okoye, for instance, uses in his book, it's called The African State and International Law. He, he uses our traditional experiences in kingdoms such as uh, Dinkane, uh, King, Dinkane, King of the, the Zulu, to talk about how the inability of Eurocentricity to understand the historical legal dynamics and sovereignty of ancient kingdoms such as the Zulu kingdom result in the current kind of diverse uh, diversion where we see that European, Euro, like international law is, it becomes so Eurocentric by ignoring these African experiences. Then in areas beyond what has been talked, we can pull in scholars such as Anaim and Teng who argue about the role, of, the role of African multiculturality in the development of international human rights law. Then we have uh, scholars such as Nasila Rembe who argue about Africa's contribution to the development of international law of the sea. So then Gadvi, as he quotes Olawale, says that Contributionists view this kind of uh, development in international law as an intercivilizational participation in the process of crafting genuinely universal norms. That that was of concern. That point was of concern to me. Like, you know, uh, as Twilers have these uh, serious arguments against the whole idea of civilization because it's tied to the aspect that who discovered Africa then, who started 
introducing them to the new reality of life where we stop wearing uh, goat skin and start wearing kind of Western affairs and those, all those sorts of things. Anyway, in the contemporary, contributionists argue that Africa is an active participant in the, the development of new international legal norms, or Africa is actively involved in strengthening the existing ones through the adoption of African conventions on international law, through the establishment of African contributions or commitments to international law, or through membership in international institutions. That's the argument that they bring. And since the 1970s, uh, the 1940s onwards, uh, all the way to the adoption of the new international economic order, the participation of African countries in institutions such as the World Bank and the United Nations has kept on increasing and therefore they take those experiences as a contribution to the development of international law. And Gati also has been pointed in the article, the 1971 UNITAR seminar on how contributionists, how contributionists, African contributionists have helped to bring to light international law norms and practices that existed prior to the colonial rule. This, these are developments towards a, the right direction because they help introduce the African voices in, into the history of international law. But is this enough? Does it get to reflect the status that our Africa has been given in international law? Does it get to reflect our lived reality? Critical scholars then come in from that perspective of asking such questions that is it enough to incorporate our voices into international law? So Gathi, Makao, Mtua, Okafo, you name all these African trailers or critical scholars, believe that contributionists aim to simply incorporate Africa's contribution to the history of international law will not make international law sufficiently responsive to the needs of Africa. So what needs does Africa have? We can get to debate, that's debatable, and it's subjective from one country to another. But in their view, contributionists have failed to unmask the Eurocentricity and colonial structures that presently sustain global North domination over Africa. So regardless of what interest Africa, what special needs and interests that Africa has, we have one common concern, that we want to be free, that we want to be able to uh, achieve our highest goals and aspirations as a people. But the structures and nature of international law often plays against us. So Gathi's biggest argument then from the paper comes in to show how or argue that contributions obsession with defending international law, universal and coherent discipline fails to pay attention to the Europe, Europeanization of African cultures and knowledges, and it does not seriously engage with the colonial origins of international law. This is where my grandmama would be like, hey, dude, you, you've become such a, such a mzungu or something like that. So it's, ju it's just pointing to the perspective that you are, you, you are losing your culture slowly by the the reality of experiencing and interacting with international law on a daily basis, daily or regular basis. So when closely interrogated, notions such as uh, sovereignty, equality of states, universality of international law can be seen to exhibit certain colonial patterns that determine the distribution of rights, duties and privileges among different states in international law. So what do, do trailers have to say about this? They argue that these institutions are illegitimate. Institutions such as the United Nations, international law structures such as human rights. And Macau Mtua paints this properly in one of his article on uh, human rights called victims, savages, and saviors. And Gathi also paints this in most of his articles 
all the way to the current forum that he runs called the Afronomy Forum. And you begin to understand how then critical scholars are pushing for resistance, reconstruction and reform, or even reform of international law, or even withdrawal from international institutions, such as the UN, the ICC. So we can pull things such as recent African threats to withdraw from the ICC and focus on the establishment on, Afri on an African criminal court as part of the resist and reform project. But that's also debatable whether it fits within that perspective because we know a couple of critical scholars who are against that move by the very fact that Africa is dominated by impunity. But then you get to see in the article that he argued that the impunity and issues such as corruption that we're experiencing in Africa are also a creation of international law by the very fact that they, let's call them the founding fathers, our independence, our fathers at independence were so obsessed with self-actualization that they, they, they were, international law held them to just exercise their greediness at the expense of their people and therefore establish these cultures of uh, corruption and everything. Anyway, the points of conflict then, when we compare the critical scholars and the contributionists, we begin to realize that they, they actually have some things that they agree on and some things that they don't agree on. So what do they not agree on? What are their points of conflict? So generally, while contributions are, contributionists are pushing for the incorporation and recognition of Africa's contribution to the development of international law, critical scholars are more focused on the reality and practicality of international law, that international law cannot help Africa realize her best potential unless it's reconstructed and reformed so as to remove this features of coloniality. So in this perspective, on this regard then, the, the two schools of thought differ on how to construct notions such as civilization, colonialism, sovereignty, and UN membership. By this, I mean that, for instance, let's look at the whole argument around civilization and colonialism. Contributionists believe that international law is a product of intercivilizational development. So they believe that there was nothing such as civilization in international law. What we had is an intercivilizational engagement between Africa and Europe, whereby we, the people of the South, get to help the North civilize themselves some more. And the North also then, you know, this thing called cross pollination in. in I, in primary school, we used to, to read it out. That's how I think they see this thing. So they believe that Africa has always been civilized. They glorified the African past by likening it to ancient kingdoms, European kingdoms and political units that gave birth to international law concept, which is the international law that we now call the practice of modern civilized nations. and this can be picked up from the ICJ statute. Whereas critical scholars then come in and argue like, look, look, as much as you argue that this is an intercivilizational engagement, international law is seriously predicated on the civilization project that was developed from the global north perspective that considered Africa as a backward, dark and uncivilized continent. For Contribution is then, while colonialism is seen as a suspension of our old civilization and replacement of that with a European civilization, twelve scholars believe that civilization and gender still continues to shape how international law is not only developed because in law is a continuous development, but also inserted or exerted on Africa. By focusing on then promoting 
the treaties that existed between African chiefs and Europeans in the ancient times, contributions failed to recognize how treat these treaties helped produce and sustain unequal relations in international law based on the civilization project. Elsewhere, for instance, uh, Angie Chimney and some of these other 12 scholars have described uh, such treaties as an unequal means for legally granting non-Europeans a status that they were presumed not to have so that you can make, then make them eligible for disempowerment and colonization. It's the point where you give somebody some power so that they have some legitimacy for you to be able to strip them of every right that they initially thought they had. That's what Twilers believe some of these ancient intercivilizational, if I can quote the contributionist, uh, contributionist argument or engagement brought to international law. Thus, Twilers believe that contributions are to blame as much as we can blame Eurocentricity and coloniality for the disprivileging of and exploitation of Africa in international law. We can also blame the contributionists for enabling this narrative to continue existing. Then, on issues such as sovereignty, contributionists view Africa as a continent that has always been sovereign on its own. Therefore, they proclaim that our sovereignty is an unbroken narrative that has existed right from the past to the present, and that colonialism was just a mere suspension of sovereignty. That even if we were colonized as a continent and as a people, we never lost our sovereignty. It was only put in a small basket, stored in a store somewhere. And in the 1950s, when we began get, getting our independence back, everybody went to this store and got their sovereignty back. So it's like when you're in high school and you commit, you make a mistake and you're suspended to go back home. So that's the way they view it. They're like, you being sent home to come back with your parents doesn't mean that you stop being a student. You're still a student, only that you're not allowed to be within the school during that period when your suspension is valid. So as Gaffey then puts it, contributions believe that while international law was on suspension during the sustenance of colonialism, it was restored that independence to individual sovereign African states. In contrast, then, Gathi goes on to argue and follow some of the other 12 scholars that by presenting sovereignty from this perspective, contributionists fail to, to recognize that sovereignty is more of a notion developed to, continue to sustain the management of African nations or all nations that have a different perspective by reinforcing colonization agenda and by categorizing countries countries as non-sovereign by the very fact that they do not fit into the European likeness and image of what a sovereign state should be like. On admission to the United Nations then, and I'm going to finalize here, uh, contributions believe that admission to the United Nations means that uh, African states end up becoming equal participants and makers of international law. Whereas critical scholars like uh, Tamil Van Zan then go on to argue that this is an act of recolonization. Like when you join these international institutions as an African country, you're introducing yourself to a new form of domination, which will be expressed, uh, mostly expressed in the language of universality and globalization. But in reality, you're being, you're being recognized again, and they pull in practices from the permanent five members of the United Security, United, United Nations Security Council to explain this. On common grounds, though, they both believe in the role of African scholarship in shaping international law. They both believe that Whereas African scholarship, scholarship on international law cannot be expressed in a singular language, we have a common enemy. And this common enemy are issues to do like 
economic domination and racism in international law. And they believe in the importance of African history, our past. And as pointed by scholars such as Chimney, the best road to understanding international laws, present and future travels through the past. So both contributionists and uh, critical scholars travel through Africa's past to be able to show us what, what can be Africa's place in the future of international law. Therefore, they present history as the, our best tool for understanding Africa's place and role in international law with methodologies such as historiography and historicization being the best tools for examining Africa's contribution and position in international law. They believe in the rejection of racism, I've already said that, and since the 1960s coming on this way or through the new international economic order to the present, you realize that neither the contributionists nor critical scholars really believe that international law is not good for Africa. They believe that it's good, but not absolutely good. And therefore they believe that if reformed and properly constructed to reflect the needs and aspirations of Africa, then it can be a ground for liberation. And I'm quoting Gathi's recent paper. It should be one of the recent papers by Gathi in this area. Now, my take last word is that when I was looking through the paper, I noticed Gathi using a concept known as uh, the legal paganism concept, whereby he argues that international law has been elevated to the level where it can be seen as a religion that exists on its own. And therefore, it's central to itself, it survives on its own, and it does not answer to anyone. That's what we are told we're meant to see international law as. And because of this perspective then, and because this legal or legal paganism nature is dressed in Eurocentric clothes and everything, then we begin to realize why the global north and countries such as the United States can expressly use international law all the time in a manner that no another country in the world can use it, especially from Africa. Sometimes you wonder why can't we use international law the same way it's being used by other countries. It's because they control that church. We all worship this church called in this church called international law, but the way it's made is that there's a higher authority controlling it, and that authority is Western. And Africa's voices have not yet made it to that level. And therefore, that's why you realize that then critical scholars argue that international law continues to perpetuate Western superiority and ignore the lived reality of Africans because of it has been elevated to being like a church of its own that you cannot question that if you go against you are considered to be moral or whatever language they might use to to describe you how then do we gather evidence to prove that legal paganism is being exerted on africa the question to ask ourselves here can a law that facilitated and sustained the colonization and subjugation and domination of africa be viewed as fair to a continent that is for so long considered dark and backward so while while here we can argue that the creation of inequalities between the North and the South was a product of international law, can we then say that international law can help in the eradication of those inequalities? Presently, international law is presented as a norm that regulates interrelations between equal states and equal people. Are we real equal in the face of the lived reality of the international polity? Yet, one can easily begin to deduct how these hegemonic powers in areas such as economic, environmental, and political development of international law are shaping the reality of Africa. From a practical application of international law, African sovereignty is a myth, in my opinion. It's a mythology that we need to begin to, to deduct from to, to determine what is really 
what it really means to be an African in international law, not only an African person, but also an African continent, an African country. Our political independence was the beginning of a new period of subjugation, all to call it neocolonialism. Therefore, in my opinion, uh, colonialism never ended. Most international institutions are agencies for sustaining domination in Africa. Most of the failures that we experience as African countries are predicated on the colonial legacies that underpinned international law and are still embedded in international law. 12 scholars have also written a, a lot around this area. So the problem with critical scholars will be one that as much as they help bring these issues to light, to light they're still struggling to find a ground for reform. We are trapped in between this idea of where we believe in utopianism and real politics, where we, know, we keep on talking, but we've not really achieved a status that can be able to move us from the marginalized scholarship group that we are to the central players in shaping and reforming international law. And it, given how presently people who challenge the international status quo are constructed, there's a risk that people who push for reforms in international law might be seen as attempting to destabilize the international system by challenging the political, economic, and military hegemony of the West. And that's then a dangerous road to go down on because as Gathi has shown from much of his research, hegemonic power claims universality, interdependence, peace, security, as a common belief for everyone. And therefore, any form of resistance or push for reform will quickly see you pushed into the realm of being a threat to international peace and security. And that's probably why then you don't see many Africans pushing for reforms in that area, even in our academic institutions. Most of the books that we use in learning law in our institutions come from Europe. Most of the principles that underpin most subjects begin with thought, contract, uh, criminal law, all these sorts of legal modules that we study in our Kenyan and African institutions are underpinned by Western philosophies. How then do you begin to decolonize the system if every day we also facilitate and enable the colonization? From September 11th, 2001, coming this way, Western countries have used issues to do with international security to tighten their grip on international law. And therefore, at the moment, every issue can quickly be pulled into the securitization narrative. So any kind of opposition that is expressed against the contemporary status of international law can be seen as a threat to international peace and security from that perspective that you are enabling terrorists by questioning the status of international law, basically that. So these resulting patterns then lead me to conclude and use Macau Mutua's words that international law is illegitimate and it keeps on reproducing the hierarchies that sustain the subordination of Africa and therefore we need to fight for our space. We need to develop ourselves in a manner that expresses not only independent thinking but also independent writing and expression of our African values and norms in international law. Thank you. Thank you so much, Tom Keen. Oh my goodness, I think you've given us such wonderful fodder for our plenary discussion. I see our Dean is present, Professor John Osogo Ambani. He has led us previously in this forum in a discussion on decolonization. And I'm sure he will want at some point um, after Harrison to give us some of his thoughts around today's discussion. Thank you, Dean, for joining us. Allow me to also acknowledge all our heads of departments um, Mr. Joseph Umolo, Mr. Jared Gekombe, who is also facilitating our meeting today. Mr. Ronald Omudi, thank you so much for that support. 
my colleagues who are also present, uh, Mr. Edmond Shikoli, Ms. Ruth Juliet Kashanja, who is also on leave, but who has joined our forum. Thank you so much for your support to our discussion today. Um, before we take the plenary, I would like to invite Harrison to give us his thoughts. As Tom Keen said, um, you are on the hot seat because you of your current connection and past connection to James Gilgadi Prof, whose article we are discussing today. So we are very keen to hear what your thoughts are around twill, around the place of Africa in international law. Do you agree with Tom Keen that international law is illegitimate? What tools do we have for asserting our sovereignty within a system that perpetuates inequality? We are very, very keen to hear your thoughts around this. So Harrison, if you could, we'd like you to just come on and give us your thoughts before we open up the session to the rest of the team to give us their thoughts on what we are discussing today. Uh, thank you so much, Luciana. I, I was my video was put off for me, and I've tried to put it on. It's not because um, and I can't do it, so that's the reason why. Um, and um, so I don't, I don't, I, 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 I would have wanted you to see me, but um, yeah, I think there's a okay. I think now that's uh, done. Thank you. Um, I want to start by uh, saying, in case I have any internet, uh, an internet problem, please tell me because I've been uh, having a little bit of, an, uh, of I've, I've been struggling a bit today. So thank you, Luciana, for uh, setting this up and for okay. welcoming me. Thank you, Tom Keen, for suggesting that we read and uh, discuss this uh, important contribution. And uh, thanks for everyone for coming in and for attending. I see very many friends, very many colleagues, uh, some of my uh, students and some of my fellow travelers in the twill movement. That's where I want to start. Uh, I think Tom Keen said that, you know, um, he, will, he will lump me up as a twiller. I, I actually am a card carrying member of the twill movement. And it's not that we carry cards, uh, it's a movement that people can join without being called to join. Um, it's a conscientious movement, it's an epistemic movement, and it's a theoretical movement. So you can join um, by, by association, by saying you are a member. You don't need to apply for membership. Uh, and if you start with a conclusion that, Tom, that the conclusion that Tom King had by saying international law is illegitimate, then in a sense, at least relationally, you're making a twill argument. Whether you are a twiller is a different question. Whether you are a twiller is a different question because then you have to self-identify, okay? And this is important so that I really trace the, uh, the idea of how we think about, about twill. Whether you are a twiller is different. And I say this because there are very many people who have made twill arguments, but have refused to self-identify as twillers. And it's not because it's a derogatory movement, they have their own reasons. I think the biggest example that I can think about of a scholar who's a towering scholar, who makes Twill's argument throughout his scholarship is um, Muru, uh, M. Sonaraja. Sonaraja is an international scholar of high stature in international investment law. His entire scholarship is Twill based, but he has refused to identify, to self-identify as a Twiller. So that's why uh, I, I am doing this. Now, to get back to the paper that we are discussing today, at least I think I need to make one important, something that we really need to note. Here, we have Professor James Gavi, whom I, uh, I call prof, both as an academic title, but as an, a, a title of respect, honor, and friendship, uh, labeling the movement, saying that he's, he's labeling, he's mapping a system, he's saying that, I have read the scholarship in this area in Africa, and I'm going to label it for you. And I'm going to tell you that um, there, are, there are two ways of thinking about it. You can think about the movement as people, some people who are contributionists and some people who are critical. And I think Tom King has done a very good job in terms of tracing and telling us what the arguments that he makes in the paper. I'm going to do two additional mappings for you that also sort of trace this heritage. So the first uh, sort of a mapping has been done by other twelve scholars. Uh, for those who are not 
are very familiar with the third world approaches to international law, I will give you a small primer to what it really is after I do this, uh, tell you about this mapping exercise. If you read Anthony Angi, who has a heritage that is similar to Professor Gadhi because he also did his postgraduate uh, his graduate uh, schooling at Harvard, and B.S. Chimney, who did his graduate study uh, in the United uh, Kingdom, and both of them are like towering third world approaches, international law scholars. They have done their own mapping and they have periodized toil. They have periodized, they have said, and this is this include uh, Global South scholars, everyone who has self-identified and written as a, as, a, as a twiller, they have said that twill can be divided into two. You have twill one, and then you have twill two. And they have said that twill one is an older movement that came before twill two. And interestingly, if you want to know that this idea is very interesting, uh, uh, um, Taslim, or Elias, who is now being labeled by Prof. James Gethi as uh, you know, a contributionist, is categorized by Anthony Engi and B.S. Chimney as a 12-1 scholar. Now, I'm telling you that people are mapping other people. They're saying this person belongs to this group. And they have other scholars that um, in, 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 um, in Africa, for example, Taslim Oluwale Elias, is definitely, according to them, 1. And I think he is 1. and I'm going to explain what 1 and what 2 is. Uh, George Zabisab, who is still alive, alive and kicking actually, still even sitting in arbitral panels, is also considered as a strong member of 2 Um Oji Omuzorike, his, his first name is, is Omuzorike, Oji Omuzorike. So people refer to him as UO Omuzorike. His name is Omuzorike, Oji Omuzorike. Uh, another great Nigerian scholar is also categorized as part of Trail One. Many of you will know Professor Kebambai, who is a towering Senegalese scholar, and maybe or arguably referred to as the father of the African Charter of Human and People's Rights, is also categorized as a trail one scholar. Um, and you've had, you know, sort of other names that, uh, you know, um, have been mentioned. The, the idea is this scholars who sort of wrote just after the independence of African states, most of them are categorized as trail one scholars. So there's trail one and trail two. So that's the first mapping done by Anthony Engi and um, B.S. Chimney. Uh, you, can, you can then think about another mapping exercise that has now been done by B.S. Chimney on his own. And B.S. Chimney is card carrying member, Marxist tradition, twill scholar. He says it himself. He said, I am a twill scholar. Okay, so I'm not labeling him. He has uh, said that there are many approaches to international law. And just like uh, uh, Prof. James Gethi, he also sort of is going towards the direction of, um, you know, categorizing based on whether it's a critical school or whether it's a mainstream school. But he has said that there are many critical schools, but you can divide international law approaches generally as a mainstream international uh, law and critical international law. Within the critical school, there are very many approaches, including trail. So you will have, for example, what ha have been referred to as the new approaches to international law, NAIL. In a real sense, NAIL, the acronym, is the grandfather of trail in terms of birth, because David Ken Kennedy, uh, who's uh, in Harvard, a huge, huge uh, international law scholar is the or was the supervisor of the very many 22 scholars, including Anthony Engi. And he is the father of the new approaches to international law, together with a scholar whom many of you might know from Finland called Marti Koskinen. And this, these two scholars themselves really, really started the nail movement. 
and they set up the twelve movement, the twelve two movement, according to Angie and B.S. Chin. Now, David Kennedy himself closed the uh, new approaches to international law. He said, "We are closing the movement. I'm, I'm killing." He, he organized a conference and said, "It's over. I started this movement, and now I'm ending it." And if you really want the nice uh, and juicy story about it, there's a 2017 book by B.S. Chimney, uh, New approach, uh, Approaches to International Law, that um, he really details this. But outside of Nail, which is a critical school, and now B.S. Chimney says that both David Kennedy and Marty Koskenemi have gone back to mainstream international law. They're, they're no longer uh, within the critical uh, approaches of international law. So then you can talk about, you know, in his first edition, B.S. Chimney never had this, but you can talk about the feminist approaches to international law. There's a bad acronym. That acronym is FAIL. There's no failure in this movement. It's a great movement. The feminist approaches to international law. Um, if you look at the works of um, Henry Charlesworth in Australia, the certain... Uh, 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 hello, can you, are you getting me? Yes, we're with you. Yes, we're okay. with you, Harrison. Okay. Um, so, so you have the, the feminist approaches to international law, and 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 um, you can look at the work of, for example, at NYU Vasuki Nisia, uh, written very very well about uh, some of the feminist approaches to international uh, international law. And if you are a feminist at the domestic level, there's a very good reason to be a feminist at the international level because the arguments in a real sense are the same. And it is possible to be a feminist, uh, you know, to be part of the feminist approaches to international law, sort of a scholar or a thinker or a believer, and also be part of the third world approaches to international law movement. So it's, it's you know, there, there are no exclusionary things here. And as you can see, if we are calling a contributionist to L1, this movements sort of intersect and interact depending on who is making the labeling. So you, you read Prof. James Gaddi saying that uh, Taslim Oluwale Elias is a contributionist, but you read Anthony Engi and B.S. Kinney saying that he's part of the 2-1 movement. So those are the sort of three uh, sort of approaches of thinking about this. And it's very important. If you read B.S. Chimney, you'll find even more, including, for example, uh, what he has called, you know, the classical realist approaches. And uh, the scholar who's the leader here is, a, is an, um, uh, a scholar called Hans Morgenthal. And this is a very political-based classical uh, realist movement. So theoretically, uh, theoretically, international law is very rich. It's very, very rich. And Twill is just among them. Now, because Tonkin had done a very good job at saying what the paper is doing, let me say my first sort of reflection on the paper. And my first reflection on the paper is to say that that approach called critical approach is equal to Twill, is equal to third world approaches to international law. But it is it might be conflicted with contributionism. And I say it might be because even Prof himself, just last year, he gave this uh, American International Law, uh, you know, uh, sort of conference speech uh, called the Grosha's Lecture. And if you read it, you'll see some very contributionistic arguments. Let me give you one. Uh, one, one type of a contributionistic argument. Um, one type of contribution is as a, a argument is to say, look, if you look at international courts around the world, international courts in Africa have been marginalized. Yet, they also produce international law that we should focus on. That is classical contributionist. That is just saying international courts are contributing to international law, but because of whatever reason, you guys are not focusing on it. So that, that is not within the critical tradition, because the critical tradition will not only say you need to contribute, it will say more. So that's the first important point. The second important point is that you can be contributionist and critical at the same time. You can also be contributionist when you start and then critical. 
afterwards. And you, I think you can be at the same time. In fact, I'm submitting to you that Professor James Gethy himself very recently has been both, ha has had a contributionistic argument. So that then he, he's not saying, you know, there's this, you know, weak approach. He has actually called it weak approach, contributionism. And there's this strong approach, um, you know, critical. In his latest work on in the right to development, and when he's speaking about Kebambai, things have become complicated. And this is because of how Kebambai is a complicated scholar. So it's difficult, unlike uh, uh, Taslim Elias, to categorize Kebambai on any of these two categories. You cannot say that Kebambai is either a contributionist or a, a critical scholar, because to some extent, he is both. He is also part of the 21 movement. Yeah, but I think I have really gone ahead of myself without making it clear what this twill movement is all about. So let me make this very, very clear. That twill thinks about international law as a system that has been used to subjugate upon the peoples of the third world. Uh, that international law was used to justify slavery that international law was used to justify colonialism, and that international law is currently being used to justify neocolonialism. Now, I think Tom Kinn mentioned this very clearly, and I agree, that Omuzorike, you Omuzorike, said that if international law was used to justify and to propagate these bad things, how then can international law be used for emancipatory purposes? That's the question that the trailer has to answer. Are you going to use something that is evil to do good? Can you use the tools of the devil to do God's work? That is the question that the trailer has to answer. And it's a difficult question for any trailer. You put it to them and the, you know it becomes difficult. You put it to me, it becomes difficult to say. All I can say, is that there is a huge movement and there's always been a huge resistance by trailers and the peoples of the third world and scholars from the third world who are worth their salt and not in the mainstream of resistance, okay? Of strong resistance. Uh, I do a lot of international trade and investment, so I'll give you an example. In the late 19th century and into the early 20th century, there was a huge conflict between the United States of America and Mexico over investment and over the protection of investors. And a couple of letters were exchanged between two very serious uh, international law uh, practitioners in both countries. One was called Cordell Hall in the United States and the other was called Carlos Calvo in Mexico. They developed what today we are calling the Calvo Doctrine and the Hall Doctrine. And I'm going to be very, um, you know, I, I'm going to summarize. Um, if you haven't heard about this, you can read about it. It is super interesting, very, very interesting. Cordell Hall said on expropriation, for example, he said that if you expropriate property, you must pay compensation. And you must not only pay compensation, you must pay compensation that is prompt, it's adequate, and is effective. Okay? Now, if you think about how property can be expropriated for public purposes and the movements towards you know, decolonization, the movement towards you know, uh, nationalization that even African countries were involved in, you can see how Carlos Calvo says, that's not true. You can take away property, you can expropriate, and you must pay compensation, but only appropriate compensation, only appropriate. So the Calvo doctrine says only appropriate. And by the way, if you read South Africa's uh, constitution on the right to property, it says appropriate, pro uh, appropriate compensation. Now in South Africa, there's even a movement that is saying there should be uh, expropriation without compensation. And the EFF is making sense. If the property was acquired illegally, 
And this is a common law concept. You cannot base a right on an illegality. If a property was acquired illegally, how then is it that when you are giving it back, you must pay compensation? And we were betrayed by our founding fathers, terribly betrayed by uh, Kenyatta I, Kenyatta the father. He told these white people, remain here, make this your home, and if you must go, we will buy your property. How can you buy that which is taken away from you? I mean, you know, it doesn't make any sense. And you, 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 if you follow the right to property, if you follow investment, if you follow expropriation, you can just see the immense immiseration. How we Africans have been, um, you know, we undergo misery because of how international law is structured. Not in the 19th century, good people, not in the 19th century. In the 21st century, this is happening today. And that's why we need to really think, and this is this is part of the argument that Twill is making, that and Twill has been making arguments of reform. And this is why I disagree with Tom Keen, that Twill has not given ideas of uh, the, the, Cal, the Calvo doctrine, which is now embedded in the South African constitution, is reform. I mean, it's pure reform. It's saying, look, we are not going to go with the Hull Doctrine. We are now trying to move with the Calvo Doctrine. And the peoples of the Global South themselves have been trying to come up with ideas of reform. There is a scholar, I think, in MIT now, also uh, from the heritage of Harvard, called Balakrishnan Rajagopal. He has written about this very exclusively, how movements from below are trying to, to push for change at the top, including indigenous people. In fact, the, the, the UN Convention on the Rights of Indigenous People is, a, is, is, is one of the examples of reform. Guys, I could go on and on about the examples of reform that exist. So this idea that Twill is not offering reform, I think it's not true. I mean, there, there are a couple of examples and very strong examples of how this reform is happening. Is this reform being resisted? Of course. And you'll expect it to be resisted. I mean, if it's not being resisted, it's not good enough reform. Protection of global capital, as B.S. Chimney has, has written, and transnational capital is very resistant to change. Neoliberalism is resistant to change. Yeah, before I describe 12.1 and 12.2, I would like to read you a quote from a, a neoliberalist that is very interesting. This, this for, at least as a critique of the contributionist movement, and this is a, 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 a liberalist economist uh, called Ludwig van Mises. He's uh, Aust uh, Austrian. He, 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 this is the quote, and I quote, he asks us this. Let us assume that the United Nations has been established in the year 1800, and that the African peoples and nations had been admitted at, as members of this organization at this time then the sovereignty of these people will have been recognized as inviolable. They will have been given the right to exclude all aliens from entering their territory and from exploiting its rich natural resources, which they themselves did not know how to utilize. Does anyone really believe that any international covenant or charter will have prevented these Europeans from invading these countries? End of quote. That's just the question. If the UN was formed in 1800, does anyone in this session, if there is, you can tell me, even with the UN Charter as it's structured today, does anyone actually believe that uh, colonialism would not have happened, for example, if the UN was set up in 1800 in Africa? Food for thought. I'll just distinguish trail one and trail two, and then I finish this. Now, trail one, as a very contributionistic aspect, but it is also it also has a critical aspect, and this is this is giving due credit where it's due. What Twill One scholars did is to say, we cannot continue with the Eurocentricity of uh, Eurocentric Eurocentric thinking of international law. That Africans have a history, that Africans have a culture, that Africans have something they can have a say on the table. And this might seem strange in a world of the 21st century and for us who are, are born actually, uh, you know, right within the 20, 21st century that what do you mean? Everyone must have a table. 
And, and for feminists, this is even more important because we just celebrated International Women's Day the other day. You know, if you are not on the table, as they say, you're in the menu. That's exactly how the, the, the idea revolves. And, and, and twin, twin One scholars were part of the movement that helped to form uh, the UN Resolution 1803 on Permanent Sovereignty of National Resources and the Charter of States and, and, and Duties of, of, of States, Economic Charter of Duties and States, both UN, uh, you know, sort of UN resolutions. Again, again, I'm saying these ones are examples of reform from the third world. Look, the, those resolutions were not easy to get. If you read the, the, the Charter of Economic Rights and Duties of States, it's loaded. It's the third world saying we are here and we want to economically get something. They're actually revolting against what, uh, you know, what Kwame Nkrumah called neocolonialism. They, they are revolting against it, but they're getting resistance. And we have to continue with the, with, with the revolt. We have to continue with the resistance because it's a circular movement. You know, you're subjugated, you look for, uh, you, you revolt, resist, and then they, they find a way of getting back and you have to continue. And our generation has to continue what Tasli Moloale did, what the Twain Two scholars, uh, especially the early ones like, uh, and whom are still alive actually, B.S. Chimney, Anthony Yengi, James Kadhi, Obiora Okafo, and the list goes on. They're soon going to exit the, the stage. It is our generation, it is this generation that is mainly here that has to continue with that tradition. The critical tradition of Macau Mutua must continue. If it doesn't continue, the subjugation will, will continue. Global transnational capital will take over and it is already taking over. So there has to be resistance from scholars, from state, uh, nations of the global south, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, I, I would have said a lot. I mean, I can talk about Twill for the whole day. So I just wanna stop there and then we can uh, have a discussion. Fantastic. Thank you so much, Harrison. Um, your passion for this topic is coming through so well. And I've received lots of feedback, everyone saying this is a fantastic discussion. And thank you for, again, agreeing to come on board last minute to lead us through it. So I wanna open up the session to plenary. Um, in the usual manner, we allow people to either put their questions in the chat or to raise their hand and we can then give them a chance to voice their question. Of course, when you make your question, you are at liberty to indicate who would you like to address your question, your intervention. There are already a couple of questions that have come up. I'll start with Ian Madenge. Um, I believe it's addressed to you, Harrison. So he's asking to claim the place of Africa is the solution for Africa to boycott international law until it is restructured. Is the place, is the solution for Africa to boycott international law until it is restructured? He also wants uh, to know, of course, you've answered yeah. the first part of his question. Yeah. Uh, let, me take, let, me, let me give you the second one and then you can take the two together. So okay. he's, um, he's asking, okay, I, you've answered the first part. He's asking about is Twill representative of African approaches to international law? I believe you've answered that. But he's asking is Twill suffering from the power relationship in the society? That is, what is a space of intersectional jurisprudence in Twill? For instance, has Twill given enough space for issues of gender parity, disability rights, and LGBTQI rights? Uh, I'll just deal with this final one because okay. it's very important. Uh, I, I ought to have mentioned that Twill is an eclectic movement. And I thought this should come out very early. The, there isn't one sort of an approach when it comes to Twill specifically. Uh, Twill has a Marxist heritage. B.S. Chimney is an example of this. Mm -hmm. Twill has a feminist heritage. I have had uh, the idea of gender being introduced therein. And mm -hmm. there are scholars there like Vasuki mm -hmm. I think uh, Professor Diana also has also written a little bit about this. And even we have feminist friends of Twill. Mm. 
Ann Offord is a good example. So Ann Offord mm -hmm. is not a trailer, no, you know, in the sense of card carrying, but yes. she has defended the trail movement from the historian critique. The historians mm -hmm. have critiqued trail and have said trail is anachronistic. Let me explain what that is. They have said, you trailers do not know what you're doing. You are reading history with, you are reading 19th mm -hmm. century history with the 21st mm -hmm. century eye. That's what mm -hmm. anachronism is. So how can you, uh, and this, this is an accusation mm -hmm. that is, is very credible. How can you label Taslim's work today? Yet, you know, you, you don't know his context. You are not existing in his context. And, 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 and I think Anne Offord in some of his works has really taken a uh, task with this. Uh, so, so, ex uh, so what I'm saying is that Twill can accommodate, not can, it has accommodated eclecticism. It has accommodated different ideas. Gender has been accommodated. And I've spoken about, about the feminist movement here very, very strongly. Okay. And, and gender mm. questions, therefore, have, have, have strongly been accommod accommodated in this movement. If you want to think about the LGBTQ movement, I mean, I don't know, uh, I wouldn't say I know any uh, sort of a, a, a queer uh, a, a trailer, but like my students will tell you, you're welcome. You are welcome as long as you believe and you have the same passion that we have. Th there's no uh, uh, resistance to the people who can join. There's not even a resistance based mm. on color. In a real sense, twill is colorblind. Mm. It doesn't matter whether you're mm. white or black or whether you come from the global south or the global north. If you believe in these ideals, then you surely ought to uh, be able to um, join the movement. Yeah. Fantastic. Thank you. Thank you, Harrison. So there's a couple of people who would like to voice their interventions. I'll allow Melissa to go first. Melissa, as may always, I, we are grateful that you're joining us. May I add what Harrison has just said? Yes, yes, yes. Okay. And then after after you speak, Tom Keen, then Melissa can voice her question, and then Arnold can come in after that, in that order. Kindly go ahead, Tom Keen. All right. Uh, great point, uh, Harrison. Uh, to, to, to answer Ian Matenke about whether uh, the solution is to boycott international law until it's restructured. Uh, I will follow to what I add on to what Harrison has already. Yeah, my video is back on. Yes, I add on to what Harrison has already said. Then put a, a, a couple of uh, points in this regard. Uh, B.S. Chimney, who's one of also the serious trailers out there, has written something called the Twelve Manifesto, and I believe as a card carrying member, this is one of those. Uh, manifestos that you walk around with and you're like, this is this is what we stand for. In addition to Macau Mutua's uh, analysis of what Twail is all about. So uh, B.S. Chimney argues that to argue for total boycott or nihilism of international law will be a trap because international law does offer something for the weaker people, for the weaker state and for the weaker uh, continent. But what we need to do is make it more elaborate that by the very fact that we accept this small, these small gains and benefits that we are getting from international law, we do not accept in totality that international law is not illegitimate. So what we are not, we are, and I would want to disagree with Harrison here that total boycott is not necessary because we need international law as much as it's illegitimate. It's a forum through which we can be able as trailers to achieve our reforms and changes that we want to cause in the world. It's a vehicle that if we kill international law, then we, we cease to exist. If we completely boycott international law, we lose our forum for expressing ourselves and for causing the change that we Caused. And Harrison has been pointed some of the reforms and changes that Twill has managed to cause in the world. And this is as a result of the existence of that international legal system. And to add on to the LGBTQ, uh, just a couple of scholars have come up on that end. And there's a strong intersection between Twill, uh, Twill perspective on human rights and those perspectives then end up informing the LGBTQ movement. We can take, for instance, uh, 
Mohammed Azim has written about uh, LGBTQ movements across China and Pakistan and all these five uh, East countries. And also uh, that will be Patrick also talks about LGBTQ movements in the South Americans. So LB LGBTQ, as Harrison has said, is all over the place and it allows for all these voices to be incorporated into its agenda because it's that incorporating to everyone and welcoming to everyone, I think. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Tom King. Wow. Um, shall I allow Melissa? Melissa was very keen to have the voice of women heard in this discussion. Um, Melissa, shall I allow you to voice your contribution and then we can give uh, an opportunity to Arnold to also give us his thoughts on the same? Thanks. Sometimes I even wonder why I need um, permission. No, I can't start my video. <laughs> okay. Go ahead. Um, yeah, so that was a great debate. I'm not sure that it was a debate. I came in a bit late, sorry. And that's probably one of my issues with this discussion sometimes. Allow me to make my complaint, Luciana and the avid readers forum team. I think sometimes we need to have opportunities to interject and open up. Sometimes it feels like a lecture, but nonetheless, there were many points I got and insights. I didn't really follow the trajectory that Tom Keen had with with the TWIL movement in as far as you are talking about Africa, African values. There were a lot of generalizations and I wanted to understand why you have this packaged idea of Africa, even though you acknowledge there was some fluidity. And with that, my question is actually posed to you on how you reconcile the fluidity of Africa and then saying as one block, it's illegitimate. So is it illegitimate as a block? <laughs> And, why, and, and, and I mean, in that sense, then what exactly are you talking about when you say inclusivity or openness? Thank you, Harrison, for mentioning women. Yes, we were suffocating here. <laughs> um, I wanted to ask you, Harrison, about the word like approaches in, in TWIL. Is it necessarily that the third world will, I don't know, uh, how do I put this question? Is it just to, to, to make the point, gosh, the English is disappearing. Um, is there a focused way of saying, you know, um, my goodness, I don't know why my English is disappearing, but let me just start from what I'm trying to say. So third world approaches, I understand there is a missing gap in the globe, especially the global South and others that have been forgotten and now they're being incorporated created into the ideas of international law. But then is the idea of this approach to kind of consolidate um, anything on the ground, anything in the laws, anything that's invisible. I don't know that you understand my point. Could you unpack for me the word approaches? I don't really understand it when it comes to twill, because in that sense, as you said, then it could converse everything and anything, yeah. So what, what exactly is the point of categorizing twill one, twill two, other than for historicity? But at the end of the day, what is this approach? Do you have a direction? Where, where are you going? Okay, thank you, Melissa. Um, your comment also about taking interjections as we go along is well noted. Asante Sana for that. Arnold, shall I allow you to make your intervention now and then Tom Keen and Harrison can respond to the two of them together? Oh yeah, thank you. Yeah, yeah. So Asante Sana for for the session, and now uh, pretty much like Melissa, I've heard I think both Harrison and Tom. Sorry to refer to you as such. Um, speaking of African culture, African cultural traditions, and everything. So I just wanted to know what is this African culture when it comes to international law that we are talking about. For example, uh, let's say uh, I'm a Luo and then I'm the governor. I have my driver who lives in Kibra, but myself, I live, I don't know, in Runda. Are we really consuming the same culture, even if we are coming from the same tribe? What is this culture we are talking about? And now the other question, again, to uh, both is, 
Uh, so I've heard this somewhere that the only reason as to why Europe is what it is today, well-built, good economies, is only because it was able to colonize. So if we are to really address uh, the issues that we are facing as Africa in international economic law, is in the only way for us to just colonize as well, especially since the world has really finite resources. And this is not just for academic curiosity, because I think China is already doing that. And whether that is working or not can be debatable. Thank you. OK, thank you. Thank you, Arnold. Um, Harrison, Tom Keen, would you like to respond to those before we take the next ones? Yes. Um, um, can I go first? Or yes, go ahead. Go ahead. Okay. Sure, sure, sure. OK, I can, I can start with um, Arnold's question. Should we also colonize? Um, what, what, by the way, Luam Dirar, uh, who's now also um, here with, uh, actually in Europe, she's a senior uh, research fellow at one of the Max Planck Institute. Luam Dirar has said, you will, you will be, um, uh, and by the way, Melissa, you'll be happy, Luam Dirar is a woman, and not only is she a woman, she's a woman from Eritrea. And she has, she has said, that and she has made the argument that twill should not only be concerned about global uh, north south colonialism but south south colonialism and you can see where i'm going with this when i tell you an Eritrean is making this argument ethiopia has been an imperial power and she called, imperialism is bad if you define imperialism as the idea of the spread of capital or transnational capital throughout the globe, you can see the kind of dangers it can have. We, we are not going to have the kind of violent colonialism that we had had previously. Now we're going to have the version of imperialism that uh, Vladimir Lenin defined as imperialism is the highest you know, level of capitalism, which is what you said China is doing. Uh, so it's, it's not going to be uh, you know, violent, taking over land, uh, you know, maybe it, it necessarily won't happen that way. If, if you're saying, should we colonize, uh, definitely you're not saying we should do what the Europeans did to us. I think what you might be saying is, should we create our own capital enough to be able to move transnational borders? From an economic, international economic law point of view, I might tell you that maybe we should. Maybe we should have enough capital in Africa that can be exported. Maybe that way we might, we might get to the kind of economic development that the West is now enjoying. And I, and I say maybe understanding that there are serious intricacies with this and history is difficult to bet on this. So uh, we, we, we not only condemn North-South colonialism or imperialism, we also condemn South-South Imperialism, you know, you know the story of Morocco versus West Sahara, and you know the story of Ethiopia versus um, Eritrea. Uh, let me give you a small anecdote. Our, hist uh, our great, you know, historian, one of the greatest historians who have produced in Africa, Professor Bethel Ogot, has said this. Uh, he wrote about this, and he said that you see the Turkana people, when the Britons came to colonize Kenya, they were given two options. They were either to decide whether they wanted to go into the empire of Ethiopia or to join the British empire that was being built in Kenya. And for whatever reason, and I don't know which chiefs they were, they decided to go the Britain side. Uh, guys, that's the only reason, according to Bethel Ogot, why Trukana County is part of Kenya. Just an anecdote. On, on the African uh, culture uh, concern, the question of culture, by the way, I get this question a lot when I speak about this also from my students. Oh, you have said culture a lot, culture a lot, you said African culture. Is there really a, an African culture? Is culture homogenic? Can you say that you know this person is the same as, uh, as this other person? Now, when I started reading the anthropo uh, anthropological and sociology view about this, I think anthropologists would laugh at us anytime we ask this question because the idea of culture is such a complicated concept Oh, guys, the entire study of anthropology as a discipline is about culture. So anytime someone asks you the question of what is culture, someone is really asking you to define an entire discipline. 
It's like defining the in, in, entire discipline of not just international law, but law. So it's difficult, it's a difficult concept. What is for sure is that there is a, a question of identity tied to culture. There is a question of belonging tied to culture. And there's a question of becoming tied to culture. And that culture is not static, okay? So if I identify with you, Arnold, and I do, I do identify with you. I do identify with you because you're African. I, I walk the streets of, the, of Luxembourg city and I see a black person walking and I feel a sense of kinship. And I don't even talk to them. I don't know them. I just look at them and I say, okay, that's, that's one of us, Kure, and I move on. Some, sometimes, you know, we exchange this look that says, brother, without even talking. So, you know, th there's, um, there's a, a, you know, culture is a very complicated aspect. And I know you, you, even and if you have lived in the in the in the West or if you have lived out of Kenya, you meet a Kenyan out of Kenya, and you really see how you have a sense of kinship. And it doesn't matter where they come from in Kenya; it is none of your concern. So anyway, I, I'm just saying that it's a very difficult uh, concept to define and to talk about. And we can spend the whole time talking about culture here, and we might not even get to scratch the surface. Uh, finally, Melissa, uh, what does Unpack and approaches. I think for me, the idea of approaches here is really the idea to say that Twill is not, it's not one thing. That Twill has very many facets. And that's part of what I've really, I mean, if there's anything to go home with today, is that Twill is not this one monolithic thing. It is, it has, it has a agenda aspect, it's a feminist aspect. It has a Marxist aspect, a left aspect. It has a, you know, uh, a, an idea of looking at international law from a capitalistic capital uh, based aspect. It has an idea of looking at, at international law from an anthropological aspect. So, it, and there is a core that trailers are united, very much united to the idea that international law should emancipate or, deal with the misery that is being experienced in the global south. Poverty, lack of access of basic needs, just clean water, or leaving what I would say is a simple dignified life. And I use dignity here very carefully. Um, you would want to know that Professor Susan Max has done a series of three very interesting lectures. I would really, really, urge you to go and listen to them at uh, the larger part center of international law. Susan, Susan Max is a, as a scholar in the United Kingdom. I think LSE, yeah. And, and really unpacking the idea of dignity and even talking about, you know, what might, you know, what, what do we mean when we talk about say toilet dignity? You know, what do we mean when we talk about period dignity for women? And it's interesting, interesting stuff. And we are looking for a minimum you know, respect of dignity for the peoples of the global south. To live a decent life without being emiserated by transnational capital, by international law, and even by national laws that make people live in uh, poverty. Yeah, but in that sense, then why not just call it um, third world approaches to the struggle for voices? Why is it international law if it's so multifaceted? Don't you think you're losing the point saying like um, struggling with this international law idea that's also has many, you know, there's customary staff, there's general practice, there's what scholars have said, ETC, the ICJ definition, I guess. But then you seem to say, could let me just answer that one before uh, uh, you go on. It's because we are in a discipline. My discipline, my specific discipline is international law. I'm telling you, there are twin like views in other disciplines. Uh, one that I wanted to say and I didn't say is the works of Professor Achille Mbembe, who's a philosopher, Cameroonian, I think now based in South Africa. If you read his work, and if you do not know any international law, I will tell you for a fact, this is, you know, if you're an international law, you say, oh, this is 12. Oh my goodness, this is just, so the only reason why it's 12 for us is because our discipline is international law. Uh, other disciplines, I think uh, anthropology might have their version of it and they might call it whatever they want to call it. I think sociologists might have a version of it. They might call it whatever they want to call it. In fact, 
the um, literary scholars were way ahead of us. I mean, Gugi was writing up uh, Decolonize the Mind <laughs> way before, you know, they, they have been doing this a long time. And I think if you read Gugi's Decolonizing your, uh, the Mind versus what Twail is saying, you will see that this is Twail from a literary perspective. So I'm just saying the reason why it's Twail is because we're in the discipline of international law, but there are other disciplines too. And also to add on to what Harrison has just said, uh, Twail does not denote that these ideas cannot exist outside the legal world. They exist in different forms and formats, depending on what our uh, Yes, I keep forgetting to turn on my video every time I get to speak. So uh, to add on to what Harrison has said in answering Melissa, who also had an early, earlier question for me. Uh, Twail, as much as Twail is being pushed by the legal scholars who have been mentioned all along, it can also exist outside as he has explained. And then to pick on that and answer the question about fluidity that Melissa raised for me earlier, I would say that, and if, if I don't, uh, if I seem not to have understood your question properly, please uh, correct me. Uh, so you, I, you, you, you questioned why I, lam I, I rambled everything into the argument of illegitimacy when African cultures and beliefs do not reflect fluidity. But then I believe that fluidity in international law is a myth when the notion of universality that underpins the whole idea of fluidity and development of international law starts with Europe as the center of everything. And uh, Macau Mtua has really written well around this idea of why fluidity is impossible to argue for in international law. But again, to pinpoint uh, the concerns of Twill are about eradication of underprivilegement and underdevelopment in the global south. That then points that somebody may say, is the global south then Africa? I will say no, because as Grovogu has written, the global south is not a directional destination or a point, a point that can be located on the south when you use a compass. No, it's a symbolic designation meant to capture the semblance of cohesion that has emerged when former colonial entities engage in a political project, political, intellectual, or whatever kind of project that you might call it, aiming to push for decolonization and a move towards the realization of the post-colonial privileges of the international order. What then go, goes to show is that while because of these different cultures and beliefs and practices that define the African continent and the global South people in general may prevent Twail from being viewed from this fluidity, whatever perspective that we might call it. There's a common understanding that we are united by the recognition of what then uh, James Gaffey describes as a united recognition of past the democratization of the international legal scholarship in at least two senses. Number one, we need to contest international laws privileging of European and non-American voices by providing institutional and imaginative opportunities for participating from the third world. So what we're trying to push here for is that we need to remove these global North privileges that have for so long underpinned this idea of what international law is or should be seen to be and begin to also incorporate the participation of people from the global I think South. I understand what Twail is and the North Global South, but I just thought you made many generalizations in saying, you know, Africa, Africa. Oh yeah, so, the use of Africa is because I was pointing to the culture of underprivilegement. So when I use Africa, I'm not saying that I'm not recognizing Kenya, Uganda, or another African country. What I'm saying here is, as a continent, we have one common underpinning, that we are all underprivileged. And this is the common voice that denotes what Twill tries to speak for. We try to speak for the subalternized others 
And when you construct the history of international law and subalternity, then you begin to understand that the, by the very fact that we are within the continent that was mostly impacted by colonialism and still continue to be considered, the, when you create hierarchies in international law, we are probably at the bottom of the hierarchy. And uh, Ambani, in his talk on decolonization, did mention to this that when you try to rank the global orders and global privileges, you realize that Africans are at the bottom of the rank. And that's why then we ramble our, I would, as much as generalization is a dangerous path to walk on, there is no, I would argue that there is no aspect of generalization when you talk about Africa, because as much as we have some first world in Africa and some third world in Africa, by virtue of the common problems that we face internationally, then we are united by that, either by the idea of a culture that we are the underprivileged in international law, or by the idea of the scholarly benefits that seek to argue as a common voice, as a united front that we are African. I think that's, that's what I'm pointing towards, the, the common front that we are Africans and we have a common concern about international law, regardless of what culture or political location in Africa that you come from. Okay, Th thank you. Thank you, Tom Keen. Um, there's a couple of other questions that have come up. Um, and maybe as, as you're taking these questions, I would also just like to get your thoughts around, now that we are potential twill card carrying members, Harrison, what would you like us to do as new recruits to this twill movement? Remember, we are young academics. We are now being recruited to the twill movement. I think some of the things we'd like to hear from is what is the take home? When we walk out of here, how do we carry on the baton of twill in our generation? You said we are the ones carrying the responsibility. I would like to hear your thoughts around what do we take away from this discussion? What do we start doing from today henceforth? Particularly because you told us about the illegitimacy of international law as a tool for reform. So what tools do we use for reform? Um, but as you're thinking about that, there's a couple of thoughts that have also come through. Michelle Wambua would like to know, is there any evidence that majority of African states view international law as trailers do? Is there any evidence that international, that states have adopted um, the philosophy of twill, and he asks, put differently, is there any political will from African states to critically reform international law, or aren't they merely fighting for hegemony of the system, as Nyanje would put it? So that's Michel Wambua's comment, question. Someone else also is giving a comment around this. He's questioning the absolutism with which we are talking about colonialism, and he is asking, um, I am apt to identify with contributionists as opposed to the critical movement for the reason that the critics veer towards ab absolutism. That is, they think of the colonized as victims and the colonizers as aggressors in an absolute sense. Absolute sense. There are gray areas here in the apportionment of blame when it comes to our colonial history. Um, then he says, Tom King raised an important analogy in his rendering of what contributionists stand for. He equated the interaction of the West and the South as a case of inter-civilization. The engagement was not one way, it was mutual. And to bolster that point, we can see traces of African cultures in the makeup of European Western civilization. So Kevin would like to know, have we taken this absolutism to mean that there is, let me see if I got that correctly, that the blame that we have apportioned to the West around the question of colonization is absolute that there is nothing good that we can take out from, from that experience. Um, so that's just Luciana, if, that. if, if, you, yes. if you go on, uh, we might be overwhelmed. So maybe we do those three and I see even more hands and then we can go on another, on another round. Actually, I was just about to hand over to you. So kindly, um, can, kindly go ahead and then I'll take um, Nyanje and Rachel's comments. Harrison, you okay. go first since you're already speaking. Th thank you. Uh, so let me, let me start with absolutism. Yeah. Uh, this is this is not a true characterization. Actually, uh, if you read Professor Gadi's paper carefully, 
and there's a point, I can't pinpoint it, but I can tell you, and if you go, you'll find it. He says that Umuzorike was an absolutist. Umuzorike said that if it were not for colonialism, Europe would not have developed the way it developed. So he was saying, blame Europe and blame them for colonialism because they're the ones who came and colonized us. Mm -hmm. Now, the reason why at least, uh, you know, the, the, the 22 movement, starting with Engi, B.S. Chimney, James Gadhi, Obira Akafo is not absolutist, is one, Gadhi himself in this paper says, look, this is not true because Umuzorike is not agreeing to the fact that Africans also facilitated the transatlantic slavery and colonialism. Africans. Uh, and, and I think he has, uh, uh, Prof. Gadi has also written this paper on imperialism, uh, colonialism and international law, showing how the, the Maasai chiefs themselves were involved in agreeing to cede our land to the Britons. So there was agency. I mean, Twail agrees that there was agency. Twail is not an absolutist, uh, 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 absolutistic movement that says, no, it's absolute. White people did this, and we are here, our victims, we are suffering. They have been, you know, they've been. In fact, if anything, uh, doing this in itself is not a victimhood. The, the idea of, of resistance is not a victimhood ideology. Uh, there is a nice book that I would recommend uh, to, the, uh, to the person who has raised this on pedagogy. It's called The Pedagogy of the Oppressed. That this pedagogy of the oppressed is the idea that even the oppressed have agency. And by the fact that they can resist, that agency shows that, you know, it's not a complete sort of a system that says, you know, these people did this to us and we're only victims. That's number one. Number two, the other reason why we're not victims, uh, we are not absolutes as, as, uh, as a 12 movement, is because we are also criticizing the post-colonial state. Macau Mutua has been criticizing the post-colonial state. Obi Obiora Okafo, from a human rights angle, has been criticizing the post-colonial state. And this is in line with, say, Mahmoud Mamdani's critic of the post-colonial state. And, and, and so this is now a Tuela critiquing an African and saying that, you know, our states are bad for us. They have not been protecting our interests. So I've, I've had this criticism a lot, and it's not a true criticism, respectfully, because it assumes that, uh, and some students in my class also told me this, it seems as if you hate white people. It's not true. I am a huge beneficiary of white capital. I've studied in an American institution. I now work in a European institution. I am benefiting from European capital. Most of the trailers have benefited for, from European capital, including the ones from Harvard. Most of them got scholarships. That is white transnationalistic capital. Uh, most of my colleagues here who started at the University of Pretoria have benefited from white transnational capital from the EU itself. So there's no way we can, we can have an animalistic hatred against an entire race. It's not true. And it doesn't exist in a real sense. And also because of the other criticism. The other criticism is that many of these guys who are trailers, especially the, the ones uh, I've mentioned, are actually in the global north. Why can't they come and fight this battle in the, in the global? Why is Macau Mutua in the States? Why is Gadi in the States? Why, is Engi, uh, why has Engi remained in the US for a long time? At least now he's in the Singapore. And there are two answers to that, because that question might come up. And if it's going to come up, let me answer it before it comes up. Uh, the first answer that has been given is that if these scholars had not gotten into these um, prestigious institutions uh, in the global north, even the visibility of their work will not have been seen. Uh, if you listen to what Angie has said about his work, when he finished his PhD thesis uh, in 1996, he submitted it to Cambridge and they refused to publish it. It took him another 10 years until 2005 for his work to be accepted by Cambridge University Press. And this is after he had now started writing in the bigger uh, 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 journals. Now, you think this is bad? Uh, let me give you another anecdote. David Kennedy, who is nail movement, never refused to write in the known international journals, like the American Journal of International Law or the European Journal of International Law, because his work was just radically different. They were not going to accept it at all. 
at all. They were just not going to accept it. And this is what he advised the, 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 the pioneers of the feminist movement to also do in the US. He told them that if you don't wait for your work to go to the leading journal, because they will not take it, because your work is just radically too different. And this is some of the you know, ideas that have, have, have come up. Secondly, there have been other scholars who have been uh, strong trailers who have remained in the global south. So uh, Iwo Muzorike plied most of his trade in Nigeria for most of his career. And B.S. Chimney has been in India from beginning. The only thing he went to get outside is a graduate education. So, I mean, there are, you know, that argument cannot be, you know, thrown like that. Michelle's question. Do the consciousness of African states link with the consciousness of the trail movement? Uh, no and yes. I'm sorry, this is a very loyal, uh, you know, answer. This no and yes answer. I'll say yes, because there would not have been an, uh, an um, uh, you know, this movement of the new international economic order without it being led by states. From the 1960s, I mean, it is because of strong neoliberalism that this has gone down, it's because of very strong neoliberalism that this has gone down. But the new international economic law movement was led by states. The permanent uh, uh, sovereignty over national resources uh, resolution in the, in, the, in the UN was done by states. When they met in Bandung and from the G77, that was states doing. That was not twin scholars doing it. This is states actually doing it. When they signed the resolution on the Charter of Economic, um, you know, rights of uh, economic rights and duties of states, this was states that was doing it. This was not uh, uh, twin scholars. This was not a practitioner's movement. Now, currently, there have been resistance. It, it might not be, you know, as as critical a resistance as there is, but there is. I'll give you one example. When it comes to international investment, Tanzania has been resisting through its domestic legislation. When a domestic legislation comes up, that is a state movement. South Africa having the Calvo doctrine in its constitution, that's a state doing this. This is not, this is not a twin scholar writing a paper or a, a practitioner saying something. So th there have been uh, states that have embodied this uh, twin uh, approach and some are continuing. The level has gone down for African states, I have to admit, but that's why we have to keep on. Luciana, that's what we must do. I think that's our role now. That's mm -hmm. that, what, that is what we must do. We must push our states to do the right thing. Mm -hmm. Our leaders in Africa are transnational capitalists. They are gaining from transnational capitalists, uh, capital. I'm sorry to say, but our president is a transnational capitalist. The president of South Africa is a transnational capitalist. We must therefore push, we must push them to do the right thing for the people who are poor. That's why uh, recently we were saying we shouldn't have signed the, Europe, the economic partnership agreement with the UK. With, imagine our, our state did it, it still did it, even after we told them not to do it. But are we going to throw that, that uh, you know, uh, uh, that, uh, in the towel and say, oh, it's gone, you know, uh, the politicians are gone. Uh, we, we must continue with the struggle. What we must do out of this and what we must learn out of this is that this, this, this is a, it's, it's a struggle. Independence was a struggle. Uh, if you ask the South Africans, they'll tell you it never was gotten easy. So we must continue. And, and also the struggle continues from within, whereby we push our own governments to remain accountable to its own people, as well as pushing the external of regimes that's like for non-interference. So it's a matter of balancing between seeking non-interference, but also seeking accountability back at home, because there's no way we're going to, to say that we don't like Eurocentricity or we don't like this European interference in our system so we don't like coloniality when back at home we are literally colonized by our own leaders so that's that's the best the basis from which twila the twilas try to account for itself we try to to criticize our own governments for what they're doing wrong but also maintaining the original idea that what these leaders are doing wrong is an enabler has been enabled by the global north, by virtue of how international law was designed, by virtue of how 
uh, the granting of independence. Our independence constitutions were designed in a way that enabled these post-colonial leaders to continue perpetuating coloniality, even if they were themselves Africans. So we can call this brainwashing or whatever we call it, but by the end of the day, we go down to the fact that Africa might actually be its own problem in one way or the other, by virtue that we might like a common voice that we might speak through, by virtue that we tend to sell out on most of the beliefs that we hold on to. But as Harrison has pointed out, and many of the other tool scholars have pointed out, there is always space for recruiting more people. And one of when I was having a conversation with one of my friends that uh, I'll be contributing to this conversation, to this session, one of the questions they asked me was, how, how do you believe that you are an African when you live in America, you work in England, and you, you've previously been working at the UN? How do you then dif end up differentiating this benefits of capitalism and globalization that you've enjoyed. Now say that, and my, my, my response to that is directly to what Harris is directly connected to what Harrison was just saying that we should never forget the foundation of who we are. And that's, that might be, be my parting shot here that as much as we do believe that my, many of the problems that Twill is concerned with are trickling down from the global north towards the global south. There's also the whole idea of that. Sometimes you've got to go to the source to understand this problem better. Most of the global north institutions have quickly opened their doors for Twill researchers are based on the history that Harrison has also given us that over the years, as much as there was rejection, there, there's been some acceptance. Whereas when you go back to African, most African institutions, you realize that they're still not open to this idea of incorporating trail and decolonization arguments into their scholarships. And that then means that if it means that you will have to be in the global north to voice out your concerns about international law, then that's where you've got to be. To answer uh, one question, I think that question came from, actually it was Omolo's uh, point, that Africa must identify its agenda, including its culture and civilization on the international stage and invest some efforts in consistently developing and promoting Seated. We are not seated at the peripheral. That's what I wanted to comment about. We are not seated at the peripheral because you've seen African states push for reforms in international criminal law. And Harrison has also given us many other examples of where African, African states themselves live alone African scholars because scholars have done much of the, the heavy lifting in terms of developing the Twila agenda. But states themselves have furthered this agenda through action. Harrison has given us a couple of examples but you can also pick some of this, pick climate change, the whole principle of common but differentiated responsibilities can be under being done that. The whole practice of historical responsibility and polluter pays principle, all those principles have, when you, you look back to their negotiation and adoption, they have a kind of resistant reform argument underpinning them. When you come to the human rights section, uh, you will realize that the African Convention of Human Rights is a bit, is worded a bit different in some sections. That's by the very fact that African states believe that the existing, no, let me call them global north originated human rights concepts do not recognize some African human rights perspective and therefore the African, uh, I think it's called the Charter on Rights of, Rights of Children Convention in Africa. There's something like that. And also the, the old con African Convention on Human Rights. They have some kind of twilism under, underneath them, even if they do not, again, Harrison said to this early, uh, earlier that 
we might not expressly identify as 12. A president might not stand before the United Nations and be like, my speech today is coming from the book of 12, chapter 25. But what they end up saying, the push, the, the, the message that they end up communicating to the world as to what the African continent or an African country stands for might have a lot of 12 underpinnings to it. And that's, that's what then we keep on pushing for. We keep on pushing like, then now stop turning. It's about time we turned this rhetoric into action because in Africa, rhetoric often does not mark, uh, align with our action. And therefore we need to invest more in action. We need to invest more in producing knowledges that reflect the African experience with international law. And again, Melissa might take war with me here on, on the whole idea about generalizing Africa. Again, I, I, I insist that Africa is not, when I say Africa, I'm pointing towards the fact that we have a common concern. And this word Africa then denotes that common concern. I, I might not, I'm, I'm speaking for an African who's not in within the African continent, who's somewhere else in the world, who might not culturally be tied to what it means to be an African, but by the virtue of that we are undergoing or facing the same struggle, then let's use that identity to identify with that. Fantastic. Thank you. Thank you, Tom Keen. Um, I know we could go on and on about this, and we've had a similar engagement on decolonization, as you've, you've mentioned. So I think in the interest of time, I'll just take two last interventions, and then we can close the session. We can always have a follow-up session um, on the same topic after this. So um, Nyanje, could I kindly ask you to go first, and then Rachel, you can, you can make your interventions, uh, after which we will close the session. Uh, so good afternoon, and uh, I am really uh, honored to be here today to listen to uh, Tom Keen and, of course, my good friend and sometimes nemesis Harrison um, on 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 some of these issues that that I raised. So I'm, I'm I'm really glad that such forums are being provided by the law schools in Kenya to prepare uh, students and academics into the international law world. Uh, my my view, and 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 I will try to make it as simple as I can because I have a lot of thoughts running through my mind after listening to, to everyone. And, and I actually have no issue a lot with Tom Keen because he's, he's a very, and, and with, with a lot of due respect, he's a very fancita in this issue. He, he's not really straight of where he stands on most of the issues. Sometimes he likes them, sometimes he doesn't like them, at least from that. But of course I know what my friend Harrison stands for because I've had a lot of discussions with him and even in listening to him today. My view is that and, and many may take offense with this after I say it, because my view is that toil is an opportunistic and dishonest movement. And, 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 the, and the truth is that we, we can never tell what toil is, but also toilers like Harrison have a habit of, of trying to box people into, into what toil is and whether they are toilers or not. So I'll, I'll give a good example. Harrison has claimed some, some people are, are toilers, for example, and, and, and I don't find any trace of toil in, in their works. So let's say, for example, he, he thinks that George Abisab is a, is a first generation scholar of toil. And, and, and I try to think of it as, as George Abisab as, 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 as a toiler. And except for his investment law decisions, he doesn't even write anything close to 12. In fact, if you look at his WTO appellate body decisions as a first member of the WTO appellate body, you, you find a lot of traces of Eurocentrism in, in those early decisions of the WTO uh, appellate body. And, 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 and so are so many people. So for example, but I, I of course acknowledge that he agrees that Kebambaye cannot really, be, you cannot really describe what Kebambaye is. And, and that is the thing that I have a problem with toilers trying to tell people what they are when we clearly don't know what they stand for. And as a friend of Twail, and, and of course I agree with, with what uh, Harrison says in terms of Anne, I have, I have, I have an issue with Twail as trying to think about international law in the 19th century with us in the 21st century. 
And, and secondly, why I think it's a very dishonest movement is, is because 12, if you think of it naturally, thinks of international law as general public international law. And I'll give you a good example. The ACL book of the year is International Law International, written by Anthea Roberts. Uh, if a twaler was to, 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 to read the book, they would say Anthea is, is a twaler, for example, for the ideas she espouses in that book, which is far from the truth. She's not, and, and she doesn't even uh, closely relate to it. But what she's trying to show, which is, I think, calling out the twelve movement, is saying, look, you have described international law as Eurocentric, but if you look at Anthea's work, she says, let's take a simple subject, for example, like the intervention of United States and United Kingdom in Iraq. If you open a French international law textbook, a UK international law textbook, a Russian international law textbook, an American international law textbook, they say totally different thing. But Twain has tried to show that there is a cabal of states that have an agenda of how to drive international law and, 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 and this cabal of states are correlating, which is, which if you look and if you fact check, that is not true. And that is why I've always said that Twailers are people who are fighting for hegemony of international law, not really the sense that international law is unfair, which I have no doubt that there are areas of international law that come out very unfair, especially to the global south. But also think about why I say they're dishonest international and, and Harrison is trying to 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 make this argument that toil scholars are people who who you know they had to go to Europe and do and I agree because international law is very European no doubt about it if you want to succeed in international law I don't think today or in the next 10 years you can do it in Africa uh, rarely do people do it only very few people do we see succeeding from here and I I don't blame any of them for going there but the same international Twaila scholars that Harrison refers to are actually big contributors to the growth of a white dominated international law. So let's think about this. Harrison thinks about people like George Abisab, John Dugard, Tired Ladi. These are members of Institut du Droit International, the biggest international law institute that everyone tends to listen to in terms of giving their opinions. But how is the Institute Didua International formed? Members have to vote for you. You submit your CV and two people have to recommend you. If you look at the list, I mean, there are maybe eight, nine Africans there. Everyone there is very white, old, male, very few women. And, and these scholars like Anthony Angi that my friend Harrison likes so much are members of Institute Didua International. So how are you writing critiquing such things like Institute du Droit International that are contributing to a very white male, sometimes very less female, dominated international law, but you go ahead to submit yourself as a member of these institutions. So that's why I think Twail has developed a very opportunistic and very dishonest movement among themselves scholars in terms of what they portray out there. But two, they also don't categorize themselves uh, in, in what should be, because this is what I think trailers should do, in my opinion. And I, I, not as a member, they would really not like this, but they have to look at the areas of international law keenly, because even our states themselves are not even persistent objectors to general principles, for example, of treaty interpretation, which we fight every day. And, and this worries me that even trailers themselves don't seem to suggest that maybe as persistent objectors, we would achieve this. But then also it's a dishonest movement because it's focused on what Harrison called capital uh, investments of, 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 of the white. And this is a very investment law argument and might not apply to many areas of, 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 of international law. Uh, and, and, and I agree to some extent that, that that could be the case. But why I'm saying this is just a creation of hegemony by the academics, I'll give you a good example. And with all due respect to my friend Harrison, the day Harrison becomes an, a, a, an, an, an arbitration, an, an, a, 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 a tribunal member of an arbitration, I can promise you 100% he will never be appointed by an investor. Never. He will never be appointed by an investor. He will, but, the, but the states will love him 
And I can promise you that, let's talk in 10, 20 years, the states will love him so much because what he's doing, he's simply pitting two areas of international law, states and non-state actors, and saying, look, there's a problem that needs to be solved. And uh, the problem is, in our view, can only be solved by states taking a hardline stand. There is never middle ground from them. Toilers don't seem to have middle ground in, in any of them. And I'm happy to be corrected about that. But in most areas that I read about them, I, I think they don't have to have, they, they don't seem to have a middle ground on, on, on anything. It's either their way or nothing most of the time. And, but despite my criticism, I actually think it's a very important movement. And it's a very important movement because it is, it is a movement that is, is showing how international law should be focused in the future because the international law we have today is the international law we've had for the last 100 years. But going forward, what is the future of international law? I believe twail as a, as, a, as a domain of international law is something that, that will help focus our international law move, movement going forward. So of course, I'd like to see a lot of 12 movements in areas, for example, of the International Law Commission, which is arguably the most important uh, commission of international law development today in the world. And, and I would like to see the International Law Commission taking such things. But that will not happen if those people who write twail, like Anthony Angi and all these people, continue being members of International Dua International, and at the same time, want to be members of the International Law Commission, where they sit with these friends of theirs who have created this system of a very male, white dominated international law. So that is my view. Wow, thank you. Thank you, Nanje. Um, I, I wish we had more time to take responses, responses on, on your thoughts. I, I think you have given us some thought provoking thoughts around what drill stands for and, and what it can achieve. But because of time, uh, allow me to just give um, one last opportunity to Mozoni um, before we close. Uh, we had promised that we will keep time in these sessions, and I, I can see time is far much spent. But because Mozoni's hand is still up, I'll just give Mozoni a chance to make the intervention, and then we will we will give the speakers a chance to give their final comments before we close. Mozoni, are you able to come on now and give us your thoughts? Uh, yes, I think is my video on. Yes, fantastic. Oh. So uh, mine is a response to the previous comment, and I feel the need to respond because, well, I don't know where to start. But I am uh, an avid toiler to the bone, to the bone. So I feel like we've been to match up with Sujuk Wanini. So let me respond to this. One of the things I'd like to talk about is um, this idea of what is the role of the scholars in international law and in for Twelve in particular? First of all, I think international law as a discipline has a very special relationship to, the, to its scholars in that, in my opinion, and in the opinion of very many others, it is the child of international lawyers and international scholars. The people who make international law are international lawyers and scholars. It is the Brownleys, the Crawfords of the world who make law, and even when they sit as judges, when they are delivering their decisions, they are a lot of times making their own law, e.g. Cassessor. So we already have a very special relationship to international law vis-a-vis, -vis, say, um, local lawyers, uh, national lawyers, who at the end of the day, when the legislature writes its law, eh, it doesn't matter what you think. But you know, if you're a Cassessor, if you're, if, if, if you're um, Elias at the international court, it does matter what you write. And you do make international law. So first of all, yes, international lawyers, uh, scholars and international lawyers do have a special relationship, but I don't understand how we are being expected to save the whole world at once. It's not going to happen. It's just not going to happen. I don't understand how the critique became a question of the disingenuousness of, of, of toilers. Uh, when these things were being created, these systems of modern international law, which we can trace back to at least the latter part of the 19th century, these things were being discussed as how Europe Literally, the ICJ, PCIJ decisions talk about how international law is a European thing. They say it explicitly. We are not making claims about cabals of international lawyers seated around. Uh -uh. This is the reality. If you go get that very famous case, the Lotus case, and you look at the decision, it says that the reason why, for example, Turkey was included in the, in the matter was because it had accepted the European civilization, which was the very basis of modern international law. That is an irrefutable fact of history. 
And I want to tie that to another critique I, I keep hearing, which is very interesting. I find it very interesting. This idea that, oh, we like to, to, to think of ourselves as victims. You cannot identify out of oppression. This is, that's just the truth. If someone is hitting you and you want to say you're empowered, makes no difference. You're still in the position you're in. I think the difference is what do you do when you recognize where you're at? I am a fighter. I am interested in international law as a fighting tool. I am not interested in being recognized by international law. I do not care if the UN wants to recognize me as a full human being. I do not care if international law says I do not have a history. I know that's not true, but I am interested in how we can use international law to achieve the ends that we have. And now that, that brings in the question of how do we talk about ourselves and the things we want to achieve? I am more interested in being accommodated in international law. And I think um, this especially is easier for me to come, from, uh, uh, to come to this kind of understanding, I think from a woman's point of view, because um, one of the critiques I have of toil in general is it's androcentrism, not as a, oh, they're patriarchal, they're, you know, no. But the idea that the differences in how we experience the world does impact how we think. And the idea that we look outside to find uh, a, an assertion of ourselves, the idea that, you know, there's this thing Fano has, um, and it's it's all over. I think in uh, if you read the read between the lines in a lot of Twilian texts and a lot of decolonial thought by men, is the idea that of asserting, I am a man. Even me, I am a man. Even us, we have states. Imagine even us, we are people. Is yeah, fine. That means you're always going to be getting a reassurance from outside. But here's the thing, yeah? We never had, uh, if you were a, a, a woman in Africa, even today, you know, it's the other day that Kina and Offord have started writing. There was no time where we were going to stand up and say, oh no, we are also people. We can't say I am a man. To say I am a woman in international law is like you're saying you're a white woman, so you're still part of the oppressed class. My point is, stop looking to international law to give you an identity, a sense of self, a sense of satisfaction. It will not, it will not. We have to work on that by ourselves and then use it as a tool to advance the kind of things we want to do. And one of the reasons why it is very important that we have to toil scholarship is because of this idea of ideas lying around. I don't know whether uh, anyone is familiar with works of um, Naomi Klein, uh, she's an American journalist and, and writer, and she speaks about how it is so important that you have ideas lying around for when there's a crisis and then people use them. And so, for example, let's be honest, modern economics today, as it is, is literally the brainchild of academics who, in actual fact, did have a cabal and still do who sat down and designed the world the way it works today. That is the brainchild of literal scholars. When you, you, the, the way Harrison talked about these doctrines and how they were developed by actual people. When it comes to states using those things, they're using ideas that have been developed. We cannot live in a world where you have the global North. You have Americans, the people in the UK. Yes, shock doctrine, that's the one. You have uh, all these people who are developing ideas whose governments are pumping money into them doing research and justifying every reason or whatever it is they're doing, and we don't do that. It's just crazy. It's fine, we can say that our governments are, you know, it, no one is expecting Uhuru right now to be with us. No one is expecting that. But the point is, we need to have something. We need to have those ideas lying around for when we get to a point where we say, okay, fine, here's an African approach, you know? God, we have an, a, a, a Tanzanian president who is a woman now. These things will happen one day, but if that day comes and what you have is Brownlee, is Crawford, which is what we are taught every day in class, then we can move forward. We need to make our own ideas. And that for me is the biggest thing about uh, Twail and from a scholarly perspective. The other thing is, the final thing is about, uh, now this idea of, uh, we are some kind of conspiracy theorists who think there are people who meet somewhere and then decide to make our lives a living hell. In my opinion, honestly, I do think there are, but they, it's a lot less, you know, wearing those funny uh, foil things and more like, you know, if you read the, the story of uh, the new international economic order, 
you will see it happening in real time. You know, it's like we can accommodate Africans making some small, small claims about what they want to do. But the moment they say, organize international economic law on the basis of equity, what happened? That was not, it was not done in, in, in shadowy rooms, no. The global north came together and said, now we have to put a stop to this. We are not going to allow these Africans at the UN and all of these other global south countries to do something about inequality. It was there, it's still there. I don't, like, we are Africans. Every day people use us as an example of misery, disease, and poverty. Like, we're literally the simile for what it is to not want to be those people. Are we still like, do we, is, is there any doubt that we are at the bottom of the barrel here? But you see, the last thing I want to say is about ideology. Ideology is not, and, and paradigms, ideology, the epistem. It's about the environment within which we operate. And the, the reason I like this, uh, the, the idea of ideology is, it's not a question of pointing to one person and saying they set the tune, they say everything and everything they say is how the world works. It's not that cabal, but it's something that's in the air. The way Harrison says it, you go to a European country, you see a black person, and it's not something you think about. It's not something you, you just wait and calculate and say, okay, this is my brother, because colonialism, no, it is an instantaneous thing. You can feel it. We can all feel what it's like when the whole of the Northern world was asking why we were not dying from coronavirus. That is not conspiracy theory. It is not, it's the world we live in where we are expected to always be poor, to always be the ones dying, to be the one who are plundered, to be where the wars take place. That is not, anything but the truth and the reality we live in. Ask any woman, male violence is not a theory, man. Ask anyone whether they walk at, at night without their, their, their keys in between their fingers. That's not a theory of patriarchy. Ask any woman you know. So I don't understand how recognizing these things and saying this is the world we live in can be called disingenuous and opportunistic. I would rather be doing something more interesting in my life, rather than perusing through texts of how human rights have been based on the suffering of Africans and seeing bodies of mangled Africans so that I can develop a theory of international law from a third world perspective. There's no opportunity here. It is crushing. It is so crushing from my small experience as a 24 year old to be scholar. There's no opportunism here. I would like to read the works of PCIJ and you know just enjoy the discussion, but I can't because every time they want to talk about you know like um, <clears throat> what is this the mandate ship program uh, under international law, then the only thing I can think about is Tanzania and the British taking over from the Germans two colonizers. There is nothing that is opportunistic about Twelve. In my opinion, it is a burden we have to bear. It is a burden we have to bear in the same way our forefathers had to bear the fight for independence so that we don't have to think about it. This, it's not a luxury. I, I think I've said a lot, but in, to, to conclude, this is war. I intend to win it. And one way we win it is creating those ideas so that when we have the leaders, and not just the leaders, because a lot of us will be diplomats, all of those things, you go there and you say, I am here to fight. Not to ask you people to like me. You know, we love it ourselves already. We are, we're not looking for approval from the West. I am not for, for one, I'm definitely not. I am here to fight and I'm here to win this fight. So toilers. Thank, thank you. you, thank you, thank you, Mudani. Um, I think this discussion, just like the one we had around decolonization, left us with more questions and answers around what do we do from here. And I'm, I'm looking forward to the, the next Avid Readers Forum. Um, I'm hoping we, we get to, have, to continue having these discussions around what do we do with the tools that we have, what action do we take. But because time is so much spent, I, I will not be able to allow any, any more interventions. I would like to... Thank everybody for participating. I, I am really grateful for the vibrancy that you have brought to this discussion. Um, Mr. Ongoya, who is the brainchild of this program, can tell you this is bigger than what we thought when we first started. And we just want to thank you very much because it would not be possible without your participation. 
allow me at this point to bring in the Dean of Kabarak Law School, the host of this forum, to close this session for us and to give us his benediction before we leave. Um, Prof. Ambani, if you can, could you kindly um, take over from here? Yeah, um, is it good evening already? Luzia, yes, what did say this time? Oh, it's, it's okay, evening. good. Yeah, um, I think I told you not to not to ask me to say anything. No, it's just uh, to give us your blessing as we close the session. We are we are actually reason, done. We just wanted to acknowledge your presence. Okay, the reason being that the discussions were at another level. Um, and you see, even every pilot must know how to land. Um, how would you get this plane on a runway? You know, and this was not even a plane. It was actually a spaceship. I think the ideas there were, were at another level and I'm quite excited uh, that this is happening here. Um, I was happy to hear my friend. Um, um, uh, Bori. Nyanje, I don't even know where you're speaking from today. Uh, all, all of you have no idea where you are now. I reason I cannot guess. But I was happy to hear great ideas from there. And my other friends, uh, you know, from Kabarak, I had that. I uh, was happy to hear even Melissa from South Africa, Lizzie, uh, Njiko, I saw you. Um, and I almost wanted to say, Harrison, I won my card until I was answered by Njiko. <laughs> um, because I won that membership card. Um, I don't know how it looks. But I think I'm excited to hold it. But maybe to just last statement um, as we finish. This is what came to mind. Um, what do we do? What do we do going forward? I think that was a very hard question, even as I reflected. Do we also join? Um, the first wave, second wave, and Addison gave us a good issue there. We become nails, we a new and, and nail, we become fail. I don't know what will become here. Um, but I thought that this kind of forum was a beginning point. Um, I just thought, you see. And hopefully, something else comes out of this, maybe another forum, a new idea, a new journal, a new book project. I don't know what will come out, but I think this would be a good beginning point. But the other question, I don't know how to answer. They will be challenging us to go back to the drawing board to see what could be the answer to that question. I think I volunteered mine for the time being. Although I thank you very much, Luciana Ongoya, for doing this thing. I think it's awesome. I know Julie's on holiday, but um, it's really an awesome thing that we are all proud of. I don't just as a Kabbalah community, but I think the whole uh, trail movement and sympathizers and critics, I think we'd all be happy with such a forum, like a day like this. Um, so may I say the word you asked me to say? Yes. Uh, may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us okay. now and forevermore. Amen. Amen. Thank you. Wow, thank you. Thank you so much, Dean. And thank you, everybody. Thank you for your patience. We look forward to having you at the next forum on the 31st. The details of that one are coming up um, to your emails, to your WhatsApp groups very shortly. For now, I bid you adieu and wish you a very good evening or good night or good morning based on where you're watching us from. Thank you, everybody. <laughs>